All right, everyone, welcome to November 16th's talk from Dr. Lindsay Piper. Appreciate you all coming here. Just a little housekeeping. This is our second to last talk. The makeup talk will be um, for Dr. Zechariah Curdy will be November 28th, the Monday after break, and that will be our last talk of the year. We have a pretty good agenda put together for spring. Look for a new spring announcement. We have seven faculty interested in presenting, and we'll be converting that in the next couple weeks and share that calendar with everyone. Just to talk with your colleagues, we are going to try to scatter our talks throughout the week at noon so more folks have access. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will be our attempt. Um, but giving that aside, thank you again for being here. Let me introduce Dr. Lindsay Piper, Department Chair and Associate Professor in the Sports Management Department. Dr. Piper earned her PhD in Sports History from the Ohio State University and is here to present her work on sex passports in sport. Thank you very much, Dr. Piper. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Jeff Herrick for inviting me. I'm always excited to talk about sex, uh, but particularly sex passports, uh, which when I was putting this to, together, I was like, well, I need to catch a title because it's the Wednesday before break. And I thought I'd loop everyone in with this idea about sex passports, only to inform you that they're actually horrible and terrible and unethical things that happen in sports. But I am really excited to be here today and to chat about my ongoing research. So this still is ongoing, still working on this. So not only time for questions at the end, but love some feedback as well. So this is the plan. It's, a, it's an ambitious plan, but the plan nonetheless for our, our time together. So we're going to start with a very brief, and I'm going to work hard to keep it brief, a history of sex testing in sport. You can't really talk about sex passports in basketball and handball without talking about what happened at the Olympic level. And then I'm going to talk to you about the concerns about women handballers and women basketball players. Uh, in other words, why did these two international federations introduce sex testing in their sports? And then what methods did they use? Because they were different. So handball, basketball had different testing protocols at different times. And then perhaps the most important piece, uh, talk to you all about why this matters and why this mattered then, but also why this matters today in 2022. But before I do that, I do want to just start with two pieces to explain sort of my positionality in relation to what we are talking about. So a white, a cisgender woman who loves sports. So a lot of people who study sport management have a background in sports, and this is mine. I was a lacrosse player. And I like this picture because it cracks me up every time. Not only do I look, you know, on the younger side, I got the tongue out. But I don't know why they picked this picture for the program guide, because I am absolutely about to have the ball stolen from me. So who would not want that memorialized? I bring this up not just to explain my connection to sport, uh, but also because as an athlete, I was aware during my time playing competitive sports about some of the inequalities. And that's what led me to Ohio State. I got my master's degree in women's history. And while I was there, I was studying women's sport history. And I started looking into Olympic sport and found out that there was a mandatory policy for over three decades where women were required to undergo sex testing. And so this led to what I spent a long time, perhaps too much time, researching was about sex testing in the Olympics. And so I've written pretty extensively about this topic. And so now what I'm trying to do is the, the sequel. The sequels are always as good as the original, right? But I'm trying to broaden this out and look at what's going on outside of the Olympics. And it's really important, I would argue, today because international federations are making gender-based policies in sport. Which I also should start with some alphabet soup, as I like to call it, because I talk fast and I throw out a lot of acronyms. And so I thought this could be a helpful starting point. You're going to hear me reference the IOC. So the International Olympic Committee is the organization that oversees the Olympic movement. So it is at the head, it is headquartered in Lausanne, runs the Olympic Games, sets the Olympic standards, 
but works with international federations. So international federations are the groups that oversee sports at the international level. And there are several, there's a lot. We have winter international federations, we have summer international federations, but I just have up here the three that I'll primarily be talking about. So the International Athletics, International Association of Athletics Federation, the IAAF, uh, now actually called World Athletics as part of a marketing campaign to distance themselves from some of the policies they had in the past. And then particularly the International Basketball Federation, FIBA, more commonly known as, and then the International Handball Federation, the IHF. So if you hear me talking about those, that is what I am referencing. So here we go. Again, I'm going to try to be brief about sex testing, how this all started, and this is the foundation that the leaders in basketball and handball follow. So I'm actually going to fast forward in my efforts to be brief to the start of on-site mandatory sex testing. This started in 1966. The International Athletic Association of Athletic Federation, the IAAF, is the first international federation to institute on-site tests. There had been sporadic tests since the 1920s. But this is the first time that all women competitors who are at a competition have to undergo an exam. And at this point, it is a visual inspection. So 1966, there's about 200 competitors at this competition had to be investigated by a panel of three doctors. The IAAF actually, a few months later, introduced a manual component to this test to verify that all the competitors truly were women, and, and it's exactly like it sounds. Uh, there's a lot of accounts of athletes who talk about how humiliating this was, how obviously unethical this was. These athletes are also a lot of them are in their teens. Uh, so just really traumatic and horrifying. But don't worry, science saves the day, because the next year, the athlete's disdain of this test, the athlete's discomfort of this test, leads to the introduction of the bar body test or the buccal smear test. And so this is still on site, this is still before the events, but now all female athletes, in order to compete in the women's category of sport, have to have their cheeks swabbed, have the results. If they pass, they're good to go. If they don't, they're quietly removed from sport. Again, this is mandatory on site for track and field events, and the IOC accepts this and institutes it in 1968. So IOC first has a lottery system in the 1968 Grenoble Winter Olympics, and then thinking, hooray, this works. Go us, no failures. They institute it in 1968 Mexico City, Summer Olympics for all female athletes. I do like to point out here as an aside, uh, the person who identified first the, the bar body, Murray Bar, actually wrote to Olympic officials and begged them to not use this to determine sex. He said, this is not ethical. No one single criterion can actually determine a person's sex. This is really faulty, please stop. And the ISD said, oh no, this isn't a scientific issue, this is a sporting issue. We're fine, we're good. Plus, we give women their femininity certificates. So if they pass, <coughs> They, women received, and these are just two examples of the femininity certificates, also known as fem cards. In handball, they're going to be called sex passports that women would receive if they passed. Now, in terms of women who did not pass, they did not get their fem card, uh, but this was really traumatic for a lot of women, and we don't have the actual numbers on this because IOC and IAAF policy was to just have them quietly retire from sport. And so it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell because there's no written record of it. One Olympic official said that about one to two women at every Olympics were asked to quietly retire. And it's really important to note that not a single one of them was a male imposter, which was supposedly the reason for all of this. These were intersex athletes who oftentimes didn't know. This is where I ask my students who are talking about sex testing, like, how many of you here have had your chromosomes checked? It's not like it's super common. And so to go to these competitions, train for four years, to then just be removed is certainly traumatic. So they eventually stop. 
in momentarily. In 1992, the IAAS stops. They say they stop, but they turn to suspicion-based testing. So anyone who doesn't look like what the IAAF thinks should be a woman gets tested. The IOC doesn't stop until 1999, and it's only after the Athletes Commission basically says, you have to, or else we're going to just use our leverage to uh, not compete. So the, they do stop, but this is not going to be covered much. This is a whole other topic. They reintroduced it in 2011. So this is the ongoing issue. So currently, as of right now, the IAAF, now known as World Athletics, got to distance themselves from their staff past sex testing practices, has a testosterone threshold for athletes. It's only in a handful of events. The science upon which that was created is certainly nebulous and dubious. Incorrect, some would argue. Um, but that's what's going on. I just wanted to update you on kind of where we stand today. But we're talking today about basketball and handball. And the reason for that is because this is what I am currently studying. As I was the history of sex testing, I came across a lot of information about the international federations. And there was discussion about, do we need this in our sport? We're not necessarily sure what this even entails. I really like this meeting minute from a conversation with the IOC and the EIS, because uh, Mr. Phillips is from the Swimming International Federation. And this is in 1968 when the IOC is coming to them and saying, we're going to introduce sex testing at the Olympics. And he basically says, it's not us, it's them. When we test the track and field athletes, we don't need to be tested. And you see these types of comments being made. Not surprisingly, it's swimming and gymnastics that are really opposed to testing. And I think this speaks to the prejudices that underline testing, that it's women who compete in team sports that require muscles, require them to run fast, throw far, Compete, compete with physicality. These are the sports that are in support. So these are, I should say, the international federations who are in support of testing. Most are fine with it at the Olympics, but don't institute any sort of testing at their own competitions. And so this is what I'm doing now. I'm just working my way down the list. So I already did the IAAF. Uh, skiing and snowboarding was the second. They uh, instituted a similar check in 1967. If you group these together, together, these three international federations largely instituted, instituted testing because of the Soviet Union's successes during the Cold War. So the Soviet Union and other Eastern European bloc countries were winning the competitions which led these Western-oriented organizations to think that they were male imposters, or cheating, and institute testing. There was a weird conflation about doping. There was a few international federation officials who said, well, they're doping, so we need to do a bar body test, which makes no sense and doesn't detect doping at all, uh, but it does become conflated during this time period. Volleyball instituted its sex testing protocols at its own competitions, after there was an allegation of a male imposter at the 72 Munich Olympics. The IOC investigated and did not find that there was evidence, but there was a report that there was a switch, that someone took their fem card and basically took, peeled off because it was glued on, a photo, it was a whole mess, but the International Volleyball Federation just decided to not take any chances and institute their own. So this is where I am now which is why we're all here today, to talk about basketball and handball. So what I find really fascinating about these two sports is that they debuted at the same time in the Olympics, 1976 Montreal Olympics, but they actually instituted testing before they were Olympic sports. So the other federations in the beginning had actually gone to the Olympics, their women debuted in the Olympics, and then they started testing at their own but FIBA and the IHF actually did it backwards. They tested first and then competed in the Olympics. And so you were probably wondering why. So let's get into that, why? So the concerns, what was it that led basketball and handball federations to introduce their own forms of testing at their own competitions outside of the Olympic Games? 
And I'll just make a note about methodology because I know we come from different backgrounds and we have different ways of knowing and researching. Uh, so this is largely based on archival research. I had the opportunity to go to Lausanne, beautiful city, highly recommend. Um, and so this is based on meeting minutes, it's based on correspondences. You also see I've dug into medical journals, talking about some of the issues, newspaper accounts, and rule books. So I also put that picture of me in the sport up there, just if you were thinking she's sport management, she's going to talk about who won what game. I'm very much trained as a historian, and so this is a historical analysis. So why? Why did the International Basketball and Handball Federations introduce testing? Three reasons. Three primary reasons. So the first is actually quite similar to the IOC, the IAAF, the Skiing Federation, and Luge. Eastern European women dominated the competition during the Cold War. And so these organizations felt that particularly the Soviet successes were a concern. It was helping them fall to the top of the different medal counts, the top of the different competitions, and so this caused alarm. Now, basketball and handball, not in the Olympics during the onset of the Cold War, and so a lot of these tensions and concerns actually start in their own world championships. So the FIBA's World Championship for Women and the International Handball Federation's World Women's Handball Championships were the primary location where a lot of these anxieties first originated. So FIBA organized the first Women's World Championship in 1953. Uh, this is only three years after they did so for the men, so I suppose that's good. Even though men's basketball had been in the Olympics since 1936, and it's 40 years till the women, I suppose there is something there for that. Uh, teams from 10 countries first participated. USA wins, so the United States wins. People think this makes a lot of sense. Basketball originated in the United States. People are very happy. I have these image here. Images here, we had a lot more time. We could go into the appearances and maybe some of the gender norms of these athletes, as that will be important. But hopefully, a picture is worth a thousand words and you can see what I'm getting at here. The US wins the first one, 63 to 49 against Chile in the championship game. The next year, in 1957, they also win the championship in a very closely contested match against the Soviet Union. This is the first time the Soviet Union competed. So they hadn't previously competed in these world championships. It's closely contested, and then they just go on a tear. So the Soviet Union just absolutely wallops all the competition from there on out, as you can see here. So the Soviet Union just absolutely dominates everybody else. After 1957, they are an unbeatable force. In 1959 alone, when they are up against Bulgaria, they beat everybody by a combined 204 points. So it's not even close. And you might be thinking, well, you know, 1979, go to the United States, the Soviet Union didn't compete. So they boycotted during that. So they didn't compete, which is where we get our victory. And just to further drive this home, this is not just in the FIBA championships, this is also in the Olympics as well, where they debut the sport in 1976. The Soviet Union wins the gold. They win repeat as title defenders in 1980. And you can just absolutely see how much of a force these Soviet women basketball athletes are, which doesn't necessarily sit well with the leaders of FIBA or people in Western countries. Now, if you go over to handball, it's less about the Soviet Union, but more about the Eastern Bloc countries taken together. So the Soviet Union was certainly a powerhouse, but a little bit more spread out. Um, so you can see that, you know, Czechoslovakia, Romania, East Germany, uh, also vying against the Soviet Union during the 1970s. The United States actually didn't even compete in these championships until 1975. And then we did, we came in 11th out of 12. So not necessarily the, the powerhouse teams from North America did not fare very well. Teams from Western Europe occasionally would make it to the finals, but really this was a competition for the gold amongst different European 
Eastern European countries. And this leads to accusations. So this leads to different accusations about the Eastern European competitors. These competitors challenge dominant ideas of white femininity in Western countries, such as the United States. Uh, so these athletes were often discussed in very pejorative ways. They were called men, they were called cheaters, they were called inauthentically women. This is very similar to how track and field athletes were discussed within the IAAF that led to testing in that sport. But this is also a little bit different for two reasons. So we have three reasons, we're on to number two, and this is where it differs a little bit from track and field. So track and field was all about muscles and the supposedly masculine appearances of the competitors. There's an interesting thread through here when talking about basketball and handball about height and height and hormones. So if the Cold War is an important backdrop of the physicality component, then conversations about height are also at play because during this time period, post-World War II, People are worried about tallness. So studies about height heightened. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'll be here all day. Heightened after World War II. Uh, initially, the conversation was about individuals with short stature. That was linked to malnutrition. But slowly, the issue becomes about tallness in girls. And if this is shocking, these ideas about what it means to be normal, that we have a top you know, a tall girl may find release in athletics, but only if she doesn't turn into an Amazon. And then the bottom one is okay, my favorite. I don't want a basketball player for a daughter. I want a normal girl. So parents, larger society, concerned <coughs> about height of girls. So are the doctors. So also at this time, there are different medical studies about tallness and the problem with being too tall. And a look through these medical journals finds there's three primary reasons why being too tall for a girl is a problem. The first, and this was repeated at length, was their inability, if they were too tall, to find a male suitor. They find a husband, so we obviously have a lot of heteronormativity at play there. The second was that they wouldn't be able to find a job. And the third was, well, it's super expensive for them to buy clothes. <laughs> in medical journals. In medical journals. What? So basically, tallness is not an acceptable height for girls. And I, I have a quote here I'm going to read. This is from the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 1964. Pediatrician Harry Madogi suggested, quote, the problem of the tall girl is a very real one. The tall male does very well in our society. In a pinch, he can become a basketball star. The tall female, however, presents problems, especially to her parents, who become greatly distressed about the social consequences and the likelihood of a future difficulty in finding a suitable husband. And I, if you're curious, all right, so like how tall are we really talking about? So doctors would become concerned if projections in Germany and the Netherlands if girls were to be high, higher than, taller than 180 centimeters, so 5'9". In Australia, it was greater than 177 centimeters, 5'8". I'm 5'8". And then in the United States, in the 1970s, they would, doctors would become involved if girls were projected to grow beyond 173 centimeters, or 5'7". So this is the, the backdrop of this. As an aside, and again, this is a conversation for a whole other time, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. So what did they do? Why not give them hormones? Absolutely. Go ahead and give these tall girls some hormones. They haven't been tested. They haven't been studied. But what could go wrong? So they gave girls these wonder drugs, these quote-unquote wonder drugs, which were basically synthetic forms of estrogen. So there's various types they give at different times. There's a lot of these, a lot of medical journals have these different regimens where doctors are basically fighting back and forth about, no, you should give this much, but no, you should give this much. And not a lot of conversation about, oh, I don't know, the side effects. Some finally start to indicate that there are side effects. Impaired fertility, weight gain, heavy periods, irregular periods, mood swings. Um, 
Again, this is a whole other kind of conversation. But there was an Australian study done in the 90s that then reached back out to these girls who had undergone such treatment, and it found that they probably only reduced their height by maybe a centimeter or two, but had pretty long-term issues. Uh, impaired fertility was kind of the number one that people talked about. And only about 40% said that what they did was a good thing, and they're happy with other women's treatment. But to bring it back to sport, because that's what we're here for, to talk about sport, it's not only the parents, it's not only the doctors, sport officials are also worried about heights. Uh, and I could go on and on, but I'll just point to kind of one example of this. The, there was one uh, statistician from the Welsh School of Medicine, uh, Triloki Kulsa, who was kind of the leading force about tallness is unfair. So we have parents and doctors saying it's a medical issue, and then we have sport officials saying tallness is unfair. So throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he repeatedly charted the heights of different athletes, got really concerned when women increasingly performed and performed well in the Olympics, and argued that tallness was an unfair advantage, and that it needed to be removed from competition, and so we needed height classifications. He's not the only one. Uh, Avery Brundage, who is the only American to ever serve as the IOC president, was also really concerned about height. He worried, and this is a quote to a letter he wrote to the FIBA president, quote, if the rules and nature of basketball are such that freaks have a decided advantage, it is automatically going to restrict championship games into freaks. So some kind words from Avery Brundage. Uh, and it's not just him or Killian who was the next IOC president argued that basketball is, quote, a sport for freaks, i.e. it discriminates against short people. And these concerns are only exacerbated when women start competing in basketball and handball. People start to argue about the fairness of tall women, particularly from the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries, participating in these sports. And again, there's a lot of different examples I could go into, but I'm going to primarily focus on uh, Liani Semenova from the Soviet Union because she experienced the most vitriol and criticism. Uh, the Kulsa, who I just mentioned as our statistician, statistician, he had some not kind things to say about her, saying that hers was unfair, she's too tall, and deserves to be in the Guinness World of Records instead of on the basketball court. Those are actually kind of kind words compared to what Western audiences and Western accounts described her as. Um, so reporters at this time, when basketball debuts, really fixated on her. There's other Eastern European athletes who are highlighted in handball, but as I said, time limits. We're just gonna focus on her because it's the most striking example. She ranges from, it accounts seven feet tall to seven feet two, which certainly in the United States would have put her in line for some of those uh, medical interventions, but not so in the Soviet Union where uh, athletic females were far more supported than in the United States. Looking through these different newspaper accounts, reporters describe her as massive, as huge, as enormous. They describe her as the Jolly Red Giant, as King Kong, and other descriptions focus on her appearance. This is the, probably the cruelest one. Uh, this is from the 76, the basketball debuted, comparing her to Nadia Comaneci, who was quite small, um, and competing in gymnastics. But the, I think the one that drives it home for me, Semenova is the relative in the closet and discussed only in whispers at the closest family gatherings. She is the opposite of cute. She is huge. Her hands are enormous. Her arms are weightlifter arms, not just a man's arms, but a big man's arms. So just one more, kind of connecting it to that whole fear about tall girls not being able to find husbands. We see that in play two when talking about Seminova as well. Uh, this, this is an example saying that wanted a husband for Seminova, but who could fill such a large task it's because of her appearance. This also becomes tied to hormones. So it's height and hormones. There starts to be accusations that there are certain countries, and fingers are all sort of pointing towards Eastern European countries, 
that are purposely using women with medical issues to succeed in handball and basketball. So the FIBA Medical Council said in 1985, quote, there was even a time when certain countries appeared on the courts with players with hormone diseases. At the 1978 Women's Handball Championship, out of these fears, they actually provided, quote, complementary endocrine profile. Because who doesn't want their hormones assessed for free for no reason? But they say that, you know, any of the, quote, inconveniences of this are worth it to determine, quote, normalcy. The last point connecting this to the, the hormones, the FIBA president in 1973, this is where we get conflation of doping, hormones, sex testing, he says he knew of at least six cases where sex changes had taken place, presumably by the introduction of male hormones, and he was deeply, deeply concerned about this. And then the last point, why these two organizations introduced it, they were trying to get on the good side of the IOC. They had, the FIBA and the IHF had been trying to gain Olympic status for decades. They had wanted to have their women compete starting in the 1950s, and over and over again, you see in the correspondences, they are denied. So they are not encouraged, not allowed, not permitted to bring their women athletes. And so, one of the ways they try to butter up the IOC is to say, you should absolutely include us. Look at us, we do testing at our own events. We follow your lead. I had the opportunity to interview the head of the Handball Medical Commission, and, and he put this actually as the number one. When I was talking to him, he said, yes, Eastern Europeans were concerned. Yes, there was concerns about unfairness and hormones, but quite honestly, from his point of view, it was to follow what the IOC was doing. So what did they do? What did the Basketball Federation and the Handball Federation actually do? So how did they actually institute testing? Well, 1971, FIBA introduces its form of sex control. Now, according to the FIBA president, he reported to the IOC that they did the bar body test, that they did the chromosome checks at the site of the competitions. You can just take a quick peek at any of the documentation, which is totally not true at all. In 1971, they just go off of birth certificates. So they send these home, these lovely identity cards, and athletes had to basically put a little image of themselves with some proof of their birth certificate in their identity card. So they had the national team doctor sign off, they were good to go. And the, uh, the FIBA thought this was so successful after introducing this at the 1971 Women's World Championship that they then extended it to the European Championships and then the ones that I find really concerning uh, at the Junior Women and Girls European Championship. So this started to be required for teenagers and, and potentially. Then in 1976, FIBA at the Olympics in basketball's debut, the IOC says these identity cards are not legitimate, they're not real, like you can just unglue this picture. So they won't work. So after 1976, what FIBA does is they do actually change to an on-site chromosome analysis. And I'm going to say that again because it's important and it's actually at odds with what handball does, but FIBA does theirs on-site. So on-site before competitions, and this is not just at the Women's World Championships, this now includes juniors, which are for girls. So if you want to compete at any sort of international level, not just the upper echelons, but also for teenagers, you would have to go into a room, get your cheeks swabbed, and hope that your chromosomes match your identity. So in, in contrast, similarly problematically, um, handball, what handball did is they did, starting in 1973, handball did use the chromosome check. So they were following the lead of the IOC and the IAAF, and they did the chromosome check. However, their requirements were not on site. So their requirements were put into the hands of the national associations. So team doctors, essentially, were responsible. So it says, you know, a chromosome check by a qualified medical doctor recognized by the national association. So FIBA was on site. Handball 
was done at home, and the idea was to protect the privacy and the dignity of the athletes. But again, good news, if you passed, look at how fancy this sex passport is. Way cooler than the other ones I showed you before. But if you passed, this is what you would receive, and you could show it at events in order to not have to undergo the testing of yet. Seems perhaps straightforward, seems perhaps simple, but there was actually quite a bit of confusion. So in an in interview with the head of the medical commission, I asked a little bit about this. How did this work? And he said, you know, I never actually saw any of the test results. It was all done by the National Association. It was all done by the team doctors. So from our perspective, it worked great. It was fine. Any sort of issues done at the country level. And if you ask the follow-up, well, how was that regulated? How did you make sure this wasn't being abused? And he said, well, it wasn't really our problem. So there's a lot of questions. And at Ethics and Volunteer, there was a lot of confusion. There's numerous examples where teams <coughs> show up and they bring birth certificates. Or our teams show up and they just have a nice little signature from a doctor saying, yeah, we're all good. All of the people here are women you see from all over. There's an example from Iceland where they were fined. The United States gets fined. Canada gets fined, the Japan Japanese team gets fined. So it's clearly not as clear cut as he made it out to be. This continues until the IOC halts its practice. So both of these organizations, again, following the example of the IOC, halts it in the late 1990s when the International Olympic Committee stops testing Olympic athletes. So why, why does this matter? Why is this important? Well, I would argue it is important for a few different reasons. So one, there are different methods used at different times. You have individuals using a birth certificate, chromosomes. There are a couple examples of polymer chain reaction testing. So there's a lot of confusion and a lot of turning to science to determine sex, even though kind of repeated over and over and over again, science was not an infallible way to determine an athlete's sex. But I think the, the bigger concern for me and why I really started digging into these international federations is because of this lack of oversight. I'm certainly not a fan of the International Olympics Committee's testing policies. I don't think it's ethical to just remove an athlete, but you can say at least they had some oversight. The Handball Federation did not. And we start to see things like this emerge, that different medical associations in different countries start to offer up their services to test athletes. So this is from the British Association of Sport and Medicine saying that national governing bodies, so sport at the country level, at the national level, had reached out to them and so they were gonna offer up sex test kits. And so team doctors could get sex test kits to test the athletes, to make sure there weren't any problems. And there are accounts in several different countries that it wasn't just team doctors who did this, uh, but there are examples of coaches who did not want to spend their time or quote, waste the resources on athletes who would not pass. And so I already said that the number of women who quote unquote failed is unknown, it's unknown at the Olympics. But for me, I think Albert de la Chapelle, one of the geneticists, Finnish geneticists, which went to Ohio State later to teach, says it best when there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of women who were silently pushed out of sport. Here he's talking about an incident that he had with a skier who a coach tested her, and she came to him seeking help. And what goes on at these large international games, so even at the IOC level, even FIBA's on site, that's just part of this story. It's just the tip of this iceberg. And so what I'm trying to figure out is what's underneath and the rest. And so this is my start of that effort. The end. <laughs> Questions, I'm happy 
going to answer, as I said in the beginning, this is, this is ongoing, so still, still very much looking into these different federations. Um, so yeah, anything you got, happy to answer or jot down notes. So as someone who's outside of this world, is places like uh, D3 colleges, is this a topic that's illegal to discuss, taboo, friend, you know, how does it come up in the circles of the athletics here? Yeah, does it's it not? a great question. So if I was to fast forward this to today, um, one of the ways this connects is that current NCAA policy, and this is particularly about trans athletes, uh, but you can see how intersex athletes can fall into this. Currently, um, the NCAA policy on any of these matters is to go to the national governing bodies. And so Lynchburg would fall into that. If we had a competitor with any sort of questions about eligibility, uh, whatever sport they were competing in would be to look to that national governing body. And if the national governing body doesn't have a policy, then it's to go to the international federations. So a lot of times I'm talking about these topics in class with the trickle down effect is what I call it, that even though, you know, FIBA would probably say, we're only regulating international elite competitions. Handball would say, you know, we're only at the upper echelon, we're only at the top. My counter to that would be, we've seen it over and over again where, well, it has real life consequences, not just for policies that trickle down, but these athletes as well, who you know, the coaches are pulling them aside to test. Uh, I feel like I should probably defer to the provost, right? Like that's yeah, yeah. fair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, there are, there are no difficulties with bar body testing, right? And there are no difficulties with testosterone threshold testing. So what's in practice now for these federations? Sure. Um, so most federations say they follow the, the IOC's 2015 policy, which is the 10 nanomoles per liter testosterone cap. However, uh, there's certain organizations that have ventured out on their own. Um, so not surprisingly, World Athletics, in many ways, have led the charge. And so for trans and intersex athletes, uh, it's in five sports where they have to keep their testosterone level, levels below five nanomoles per liter. Cycling has put that at 2.5 nanomoles per liter. So basically, there is no consistency. There is no consistency. FIBA's policy currently is on a case, they just say on a case-by-case -case basis. There are any questions, so they've basically gone back to suspicion-based testing. If there's any suspicions, accusations, and we'll deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. And the handball has kind of just deferred to the IFC follow-up question. And so, if they um, if they're using different standards, I mean that's that's ridiculous. There's no evidence base in that, right? Does does that mean that um, we have uh, female athletes who are taking testosterone blockers? Yeah, so the, the two methods, particularly those you want to compete in sports that have a cap, uh, it's either the, the surgical intervention to prevent that or they are taking pills to suppress. And there have been uh, different testimonies about how ill and sick and horrible this experience, how ill and sick this has made them and how horrible this experience has been. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Do you have a question? Yeah, this, my question is about methodology, like how do you get to the the rest of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you had some, some interviews. So what is the potential for oral history, uh, both kind of your ability to do it, given all the things we have to do, but also just the uh, kind of willingness of people to maybe speak to you, or do you have a way to kind of select or check, choose a, a sample size of maybe actual athletes or whistleblowers, or who would you go to to kind of expand your already yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So Meta, this, has been, this has been a more challenging project than the first go round because the IOC just very nicely has an archive available. You can go and hang out in there and find the things you need, whereas the international federations are a little bit of a mess. So it's also why I started with skiing because they're organized and I was able to actually access their documents pretty easily. This has been a lot of circumventing different things to try to get access. And so interviews have been really helpful. Uh, I typically start with people in the national governing bodies here, so different uh, presidents of the national governing bodies, and if they have a medical committee or commission, I reach out to them next, and if they can put me in touch with the international. 
it's been hit or miss, to be perfectly honest. Some people, I mean, the handball, uh, Gil Zanderberg was, he was wide open. He was ready to talk, and I think it's also because he's retired, and he's not in charge right now of the policies. He also didn't implement them as anyone. He came in a little bit after, so I think he felt free to speak about these issues. But it's, it's been a challenge, and then language is a challenge as well. I, I am embarrassing, limited in my foreign language abilities, and so that has proven another obstacle to navigate. I thought it was really interesting the connection you uh, drew with how tallness as a biological feature of people was also being used to police gender in a lot of ways, and to me that's what a lot of this test of chromosomes and everything is too, because we were finally shifting our ideas of not just how gender is defined, but how sex is defined, because a lot of scientists are like, it's a scale, there's no like hard and fast rules. Why do you think this issue is tied to sports, so to create definitions of what sex is, and get the medical science behind it? Why is sports kind of the advocate for it? It's a really good question. I think, so I think it's a few different reasons of being someone who changed history. I'm gonna go into the historical one first about just the way modern sport developed and very much developed as a space for manliness and masculinity and it was in response to the crisis of masculinity and so it was for men to prove their manliness and so there was from the beginning, even before sex testing, there was always questions about if a woman competes in sport and is good, but what does that mean about her Gender. So I think there is, of course, a history there. Um, and then I, I would add to it just the, probably the, the records piece. You can quantify sport in so many different ways. And so I think that falsely gives people some things to point to uh, because we only focus on a very few sports when we're talking about records between cis men and cis women. Uh, but I think those two together, and then I'd add the third, the, the, the power of sport. There's a lot of money and recognition and fame, and sport is really important to a lot of people. Not just people who participate, but people who watch. Some nationalism tied in there as well. So I think all of those coalesce to keep my information and research relevant, although there are times where I certainly wish it wasn't relevant. I apologize for coming in late. So are there, I guess this is kind of two parts, are there others that are that you have identified as doing similar research to you? Or you could answer, is there any efforts towards any type of consensus amongst any of these groups, like an interest to collaborate, to figure something mm -hmm. out and come up with a standard? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good, two, really good two-parter. Um, so in terms of people doing this work, there are a handful of sport historians who have studied sex testing. Most of it has been on the IFC and IAAF. Every now and then you get someone who is studying for example, the, the history of volleyball that throws it in. So there was just a researcher who was talking about the history of gymnastics, and in her book, she just had this paragraph about how they were opposed to sex testing throughout its history. So there's not a lot of people who are singularly now focused on these international federations. There's probably a little bit because of what Brian pointed out about the difficulties in researching um, this topic. And then as far as the second one, there have been some efforts by the, we'll call it the international sport movement to come together. There's been different forums and different workshops. That primarily has been focused on trans athletes, so trying to bring people together to have some consensus. Not all federations are participating or have participated. And sort of in a reversal, the IOC actually just updated its policy a couple months ago, and it said that on the one hand, it was great because it said, you know, we shouldn't do invasive testing anymore. We should not medically require people to change their bodies just to play in sport. But then it also said at the same time, but we're going to let the international federations deal with this. So they said we're going to a, quote, sport by sport approach. And so no one liked this decision. So people who you know, want some of this testing and don't, no one was happy because I, mean, I was thrilled to see that they recognized these past practices were problematic. But then to go to a sport by sport policy is the opposite of what you suggested, that people come together and try to figure this out. Lindsay, thanks for a good talk. Question, in your research, going back to the onset of sex testing in the 50s, 
Is there any record of the women athlete voice advocating for this, or is it just the powers of these organizations? Yeah, that's a good question. No, and I, I, you know, it's a really good question, and I, I put this in some of my work, but I, women athletes support it. Particularly, Western women athletes largely support it. I think you see echoes of that even today. Uh, athletes saying, well, of course it's not fair if I have to compete against, and they would often name different Soviet athletes, and the, then the retort was, well, just look at her. Of course, why, why would it be fair for me to compete against her? So in the 50s, there actually is support from different athletes, largely from the West, and I think that echoes, as I said, to the Global North athletes today who are in support of these different policies. The only time we start to see some pushback is in the 1970s, and I, I suggest, I think this is in line with the women's liberation movement, that some women pause and say, well, wait a minute, why are you testing us and not testing men? So why is it just for us? If they're supposedly unfair, then why, why is it only so one-sided? And kind of as a funny aside, there was one time, 1991, the IAAF said, you know what, we're going to scrap it. We're going to face lawsuits. It's unethical. So we're just going to do a health check. We're going to do a health check on, like, all athletes. Everybody, men and women, the men complained so much that that was the only time they did it. They, they scrapped that and they just gave up sex testing until the more recent iterations. And I think that's where we kind of are now still, right? There's arguments on both sides mm -hmm. from the woman's perspective. Yeah, I yes, yes, yes. And it, it's, had, it's not entirely neatly split between global and global south by any means, but you do see a, a lot of white global north athletes suggesting that this is the way forward, this is fair, and this is ethical and appropriate, and then the athletes who have actually undergone some of the treatments suggesting that no, it's not, and you know, natural testosterones are not an unfairness. But yeah, it is not, I perhaps, in my, my stance seems like it is a problem, but that is not a universally accepted position. Just one more, so the testing that they're doing now, is that coinciding with the doping testing? Or are they two separate groups now? Because so, doping testing has expanded massively. Right, 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 right. And it can fall under that, but it is a separate. Um, and it's not mandatory. So it's, it, if suspicions are raised, and they're pretty vague about that, but, so there still is some thought that it's based on appearances. But there have been a few athletes who have been identified through the, the biological passport um, that their hormone levels have increased, have shifted. So in a Venn diagram, there is certainly overlap there, but they are separate. Also, I think you had your hand up. I did. So this is, how does your work inform the, the questions in Virginia about trans students? Because I read that there had been legislation proposed about requiring medical certification of gender for K-12 and higher education. So, how, I mean, I am appalled, but how does your work inform that? Yes, that's a great question. So I can pretty clearly say that these lawmakers have not read my work because if they did, they would realize that we already know how horrible this sex testing experience was for athletes and you know introduced for cis gender athletes, but now being uh, proposed. So a lot of these bills, and there's something like 41 states have put forward bills that have if an athlete's sex is disputed, and it doesn't clarify by whom. It can be anyone, so any angry parent, and parents can get a little money on the sideline, any parent can just point to an athlete and say, well, I don't think she's a she, so you better get it checked out. And these laws say that they have to go be tested by a physician, and in a lot of cases, it is an internal and external uh, anatomical examination. So, I mean, that's pretty, a lot of people have pointed out how invasive that that is. Uh, also requires a chromosome check and a testosterone check. So I would like to think my work would show this is really harmful, really unethical, really problematic. But since I think it's 18 states that passed these laws, I guess my effect is pretty minimal to answer your question, but it, it absolutely relates. Yeah. Hasn't passed yet in Virginia, so fingers crossed. fingers crossed. But still, if 18 states have approved something like that, that's insane yeah it's 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 really sad really really sad well, appreciate uh, that and that's uplifting note <laughs> <laughs>